G'day everyone. I'm just going to run through some slides that I've been using for the um, UQ STAQ Physics Day. And also they're much the same slides as um, I've used for this next one, which was um, at the Griffith Cutting Edge down the Gold Coast. Um, basically, I'm just going to run through a few little experiments that are probably useful for quantum physics. Uh, just some that I've done at school with the um, students. Now, they might seem pretty dumb but um, because they're fairly simple. But what um, people have said to me after I do these sessions, that what they've liked about them, I've been doing these for the last five or so years, um, and at the end of it, I get a lot of teachers coming up to me saying what they like is that the equipment used is really simple. And so that's why I've called these um, 30 simple experiments for quantum physics. They're low cost or no cost in a lot of cases because you'll have the equipment at school. Labbies have come up to me as well and said, you know, that they find it hard to manage their budgets when teachers, physics teachers ask for more expensive equipment. And for instance, if you want to get a uh, photoelectric effect um, device from IEC, for instance, they're about $485. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to watch your budget. Um, if there's a simpler way of doing it, well, the teachers, the school, the labbies and everything, uh, are, you know, all appreciate it. So that's what I'm going to try and do. OK, so I'll move on um, to the first main slide. Look, the reason I've got this slide up, this is my web page, the seniorphysics.com web page. But um, I've got a link here. I'm going to have the PowerPoint files. So they're about 1.6 gig of file. Be, uh, the file is 1.6 gigs because there's a lot of videos uh, and things like that embedded in it and they're done in 4k so they um, they use up a lot of space but um, you might be able to get the a download of this recording that i'm making now i'll put that here as well you can see i've got powerpoint with recorded voiceover but i also have the the raw or not the raw but the original powerpoint files OK, so I'll let you know on the discussion list or on Facebook when they're ready. But you can just go to this um, link here. Otherwise, I'll put the link on the discussion list for Facebook. OK, now that's me with my grandson. Um, that's an interesting little book. Um, it's only about $12. I read it to my grade 12 girls and they quite liked it. Um, it mainly deals with transitions, electron transitions. So it's not the full range of... Um, you know, of quantum theory, but it's it's just an interesting little introduction. Um, but we read it up in the library, so it was good. My grandson liked the green electrons best of all. Okay, now this first slide, it's just straight out of the syllabus, um, but it's got all the uh, the content that you have to know from the quantum physics. Now I've got it in the same order as the syllabus, but if you look at it um, in it's never meant to be a teaching sequence, but if if you look at the dates when these bits and pieces happen, what you'll notice is that it's fairly chronological. So we start with Young's double slit experiment. Now that's about 1800 that Thomas Young did that. Um, that's using the pinhole through the blind and so on. I'll come to that later. But then you move on to light as an electromagnetic wave. Now that's uh, Heinrich Hertz doing that in about 1868, somewhere around about there. So later in the 1800s. Then you've got the black body radiation idea. Now this is people like Veen, um, later a bit, you know, people like Planck and Rayleigh and Jeans. Um, the next one for black body radiation, um, that's Einstein talked about the quantization. Well, it's partly Planck, but mainly Einstein. So that's about 1904, 1905. Concept of the photon again, Einstein, 1905. Um, then the solved problems, that's still the same thing. Photoelectric effect, 1905, still with Einstein. Um, and all this number eight's the same. But look, uh, once you get down to a 10, you'll notice it says, recall, photons exhibit the characteristics of both waves and particles. Well, in a lot of ways, that's out of place because that debate was going on back in when Newton started back in 1680 or somewhere like that. So all of a sudden, you're going chronological from the top, starting in 1800, all the way down to 1904. And then all of a sudden, you've got this one here about 
characteristics of waves and particles, which really goes back to Newton, 1680, and then even um, Christian Huygens back in the wave model back in 1680 or so. That's when they were thrashing it out, whether light was a wave or a particle. It started back in the late 1600s. So, and then you go on to evidence that supports um, light as a wave and light as a particle. Well, that all of a sudden goes back to, say, 1923, where you have um, people um, doing Compton, you know, Compton doing the momentum of a photon and things like that um, to establish the particle model even um, more so. So, you know, you've got this tricky one down here at number 10 that's sort of out of place. So when you're talking about a teaching sequence, what I like to do is pull up, pull 10 right up back to the front and start with the simple bits and pieces of um, the wave and particle theory. So let's have a look how that might happen. Okay, now I've just put in the dates and you can see 1800, 1886, and then it just keeps going through. And then all of a sudden you've got Newton and Huygens back here and then Compton in 23. Okay, so I'll move on. Now, the problem with the wave and particle model is neither particle supports all of the properties of light. Um, and I've got them here. Now, a lot of this goes back to unit two when we were talking about, well, this is for the general syllabus, the alternative sequence people will have it at a different time. But um, when you're doing the stuff about light, um, diffraction, refraction, reflection, uh, polarization and stuff like that, which is to the general syllabus is unit two. Um, we, you would have discussed these things like reflection. Um, we would, you've done the mirror, or a little bit on mirrors, um, internal reflect, uh, total internal reflection, um, or even just reflection off a plastic block. You get some reflection, refraction. Now, there, those two, reflection, refraction, polarization, diffraction, interference, are done in unit two. Now, you mightn't have done much with them. You might have really, it's just a few pages in the text and it doesn't take up much space in the syllabus. So, you know, there's not a heavy emphasis on it. But the thing is, reflection is important. Reflection is explained by the particle model. It's also explained by the wave model. And I've got yes, yes. Refraction, the next one, is not explained by the particle model, although some people try and make out that it is. But it's partly explained, but not that well. Uh, wave model can certainly explain that. Polarization, no, not for the particle model. Now I've mentioned that in the text in the end of chapter two. I've said, you know, the wave model um, can explain these things, but can't really explain. The particle model can't. Diffraction, again, wave model, yes. A particle model, no. Interference, yes, and no by the particle model. Now there's three more. Um, but this, the first five take, takes you up to about 1900 um, before the photoelectric effect was investigated. So at the state of play in physics at 1900, we've got this conundrum here amongst these five properties and some could be explained by the particle model and some by the wave model. But you'll see the wave model seems to uh, able to explain all of them. And so you'd think, well, Huygens and his wave model is the one to concentrate on, whereas the particle model can't do much. But all of a sudden, photoelectric effect, Einstein, 1904, you've got problems. And I'll just click through to the next slide and you'll see photoelectric effect can explain, uh, can be explained only by the particle model. The wave model is no good. Compton, 1923, yes for the particle model, no for the uh, wave model. Now the syllabus doesn't mention the Compton model, Compton's experiment, doesn't even mention um, you know, what, what you need to, what properties of light are important in terms of wave and particle model. It just leaves it um, pretty much up to, the, up to the teacher to decide. And in the text, I've put it in because I think it's important. Millikan I haven't put in, um, that's the charge on the electron, that helps establish the particle model. So let's run through some simple demos you can do for all of these. So I'll go to the next slide. Now this is nothing very profound, I've just got some masking tape on a bench and you've got the normal up the middle 
and I'm just going to roll a ball in um, from one side. If you watch, um, here's the ball coming in. It just goes off at an at the same angle. I is equal to R. And um, there it goes again. Now, a student said to me once, "How? why is it that the two angles are the same? And at the time, I didn't really think much of it. I, I couldn't really explain it, but... When I looked at conservation of um, energy with an elastic collision and conservation of momentum, I worked out why it has to go off at the same angle. Okay, the next one is um, just the same sort of idea, but um, it's got a, uh, this is in a ripple tank. Now, this is my ripple tank at school. It's not nothing profound and it's not as good as some of the ones I've seen. But look, all I'm going to do is... Um, I've marked this is the waves are coming in from the top going down to the bottom and I've marked the wave fronts across there like that now that's the direction of propagation and I'm going to put a barrier in there now that's just a block of um, I think it's a bit of metal stood on its side and that's the barrier and now I'm going to draw that's the normal okay so that's and there there are the wave fronts leaving. They're the reflected wave fronts. And I'll draw the line of propagation as it goes out. And you'll notice the, the two angles are equal. Okay, so the wave model nicely explains how um, light can be um, reflected and the angles are equal. Okay, I'll move to the next one. Now this is um, refraction of water waves. Okay, so... <clears throat> I've got the waves coming in from the top and there's the direction oh no there's the um, wave fronts now they're the ingoing wave fronts and I've got a piece of glass underwater there so the depth of the water is shallow now and you'll notice the refractions occurring so there's the direction of propagation of the incident wave there's the direction of propagation of the refracted wave. Now, you'll notice the wavelength is fairly big there, but the lambda, here it's much shorter. So we say in the shallow, it's a shorter wavelength. So shallow and short, and um, there's a smaller angle, actually. If you look at the angle of refraction to the normal, it's smaller. So it's slower. So I use the 4S rule. It's shallow, short, um, and slow, and a smaller angle. Okay, so that's refraction explained using um, water waves. Now, here's the problem. Um, I was saying before that refraction can be explained by the particle model, but there's one major problem, and let's have a look at how this goes. Now, I've just got a piece of cardboard um, bent and you can see the line I've got through the middle that's bending the cardboard and I've drawn the normal to that line okay it's just sitting up on a um, little ice cream tub or something like that now I'm going to roll a ball along this now that's a slight incline but when it hits the steep incline it's going to speed up but it actually gets closer to the normal and that looks like refraction to you know like water uh, sorry going from air into water it bends towards the normal so let's try that okay now i'm just shooting a ball bearing again you'll notice it went closer to the, the normal so it goes again and now looking from the front you can see it so i'll do a slow-mo version of that and you can see it speeds up but also moves towards the um, normal now if that was from air to water you'd think well that makes sense um, what's happened here um, I'll just get that to the end now ah um, if you I'll just stop that there if you think of what's happening it's air to water the uh, angle goes from a big angle to a small angle. That makes sense. The problem with the particle model for refraction is, look at what's happened to the speed. It actually speeds up. 
Now, you know very well that in air to water, the speed of light in water is much slower than in air. So the speeds are around the wrong way. Now, Newton originally tried to explain this by saying, well, at the time he was having great success with his um, model of universe and universal gravitation. And he was saying the force of gravity is based on the mass of the two objects. But what, what he was saying for refraction is that this substance down here, which is water, is heavier, it's more dense than the air. So, of course, it's going to speed up as it comes towards it because the force is greater. Now, that makes sense in terms of gravity, but in terms of the, what's happening with the wave model, it's nonsense. It doesn't work. So that's a major problem with the particle model for um, light. OK, so let's move on. Now, here's the two side by side. Wave model, um, the light comes in, bends towards the normal, which is right, but it's also slower. OK, I showed you that with the... Um, the previous thing with the ripple tank. The particle model, which is the one on cardboard, bends towards the normal, but you saw it get faster. Now, one of those can't be right, and basically, wave model is correct. The particle model is not correct in terms of speed. Okay, let's have a look at uh, another property of light. Now, you can do this simply in the classroom. You just buy the sheets of Polaroid or if you can't buy it, just get some old Polaroid sunglasses. Um, now, I've got them adjusted so that the direction of polarization is parallel. So if you imagine this first one, now I don't know which way the direction of polarization is. I haven't drawn it on, but let's imagine it's vertical and this one's vertical. So when you cross them, in other words, put one in front of the other, it'll stay light because the wave, well, the light is getting through. So let's see what happens here. So I've got the girl, she puts them like that, then she turns them through 90 degrees, and you'll notice cross polarizers cuts the light out. Now, that's fine, okay, for polarization. The wave model explains that. Now, I'm going to show you this next little demonstration. It's just using some um, grates out of an oven, of all things. Um, here we are here. Now, all I've got is two of the shelves out of an oven, a little laboratory oven. The girl's got a spring just with a weight on the end, and she's going to send down a, a few waves, and they're just going to move in the slots. Okay, but now she's going to cross the polarizers or cross the direction, and she tries to make the wave and it won't go in. Well, that's pretty, pretty reasonable. So that explains how polarization... Um, of a wave or how a polarizer can stop um, wave going through if the direction of polarization is crossed now that supports the wave model and <clears throat> let's have a look at doing the same with a particle model here we go now all she's got is a particle which is you know newton would have called it his corpuscle who would have called it a corpuscle and i suppose today equivalent would be a photon. So that's a photon, effectively. Now, what's what, watch what happens when the, um, the polarizing direction is not crossed, so they're parallel like that. OK, here we go. Straight through, no problem at all. Now she's crossing them. They still go th straight through. So that's a problem for the particle model, because you cross the polarizers and it goes through. So you know, Huygens would have said to Newton, your particle model can't explain polarization, whereas the wave model can. But what Newton did was he wasn't going to give up on this, so he took it to the next step. And he said the corpuscles, effectively the um, photons, if you like, today, we might think of them, although a different sort of idea. And this is taken out of Newton's optics. I had a look at the originals, page 362, um, that's in about 1680 or something like that. <clears throat> he said, if the um, the long direction of the corpuscle is lined up with the direction of polarization, they'll fit through. If it's crossed, they won't fit through. Well, that makes sense. So if you now have cross polarizers, nothing will get through. So with vertical polarization, 
some will get through the ones that are in that direction when they're crossed nothing will get through so you'll have some light coming through a you know a substance um, that has the direction of polarization up but when they're crossed nothing will get through and so you think well newton's explained that it might be sound like a bit of a made up um, explanation with his flattened corpuscles but that's how he did it now the problem is have a look at this um, if you now model this is just in the classroom i've got the girl with the lid from a specimen jar now that's your flattened corpuscle so it goes through watch it goes through uh, when the the parallel but look when she's crossed them of course the flattened corpuscle won't go through now that sounds pretty dumb but you know that works pretty well so um you know that, that's another way of doing it so that newton's corpuscle model um, can explain polarization but the main problem comes now if you look at what happens next if you take that polarizing filter again like i did before but when you cross them if you stick a third piece and i've said at the top here a third polarizer between them watch this so she's got them lined up as before cross them and so it cuts out the um one of the uh, electric vectors now she's put in a piece of a third piece at an angle and you'll notice it goes clear now that can be explained using wave model but it can't be explained using the particle model you can't get a, a part of a particle coming through whereas you can get a part of a, um, a wave coming through effectively what's happening is the first filter blocks um, all components except the um, electric field vector pointing up and down say and when it gets to the second one as we had originally that blocks the up and down electric vector coming through so it goes black but if you put one through at an angle what happens is some of that electric vector can be resolved into two components at right angles so a proportion of the first one can come through um, at a certain angle in the, the, um, the middle polarizer and then it hits the, the front polarizer and a part of that component can come through again so basically what's happening is the wave is resolved if you like into two components at right angles or you know whatever you choose to resolve them into and um, parts of each component can come through the different um, orientations now that sounds a bit messy but um, if you look at some university texts on um, on polarization you'll certainly see how that works okay so we're at the state now where polarization can't be explained by particle model but can be explained by wave okay so i've put a ticking across there okay let's move on <clears throat> now this is diffraction of water waves now what i've got is a um just the the uh, ripple tank as before but i'm going to diffract um, by putting in a little um, pair of barriers and just allowing a little slit so have a look at this so there's the rect well that's expl that's showing rectilinear propagation in other words it moves in a straight line now i've got a barrier in here now i've just colored them in white so you can see them they're just um two blocks of glass standing on their edge and you'll see the waves are coming through the middle but they're curling around behind the barrier so that's diffraction now that wouldn't happen with the particle model and i'll show you later you open and open up the barrier uh, you get less diffraction and you'll notice there's not much diffraction going on there it's only a little bit okay so we'll move on from that and now what i'm going to do here is use a particle now i've got a um just a funnel set up with um and I fill it up with sand i've got a girl ready to fill it up with sand now what i'm going to do is make a double slit now i've got a piece of card here you can see there's a little bit of cardboard red cardboard there i'm going to put it directly underneath the opening there and that's going to split the stream into two now this is possibly the closest i can get to young's experiment what 
Thomas Young did in 1800, and he, or 1804 probably, it's when he published in late 1803, 1804, he had um, pin, he put a pin hole in a, a blind facing the sun and put a little card in front of it. You know, well, you'll see in the diagram where he put the card, but the card split the beam into two, and you think of them as being two coherent beams, then they fell on a wall, opposite wall, and you formed the traditional, or well, the pattern you know of um, dark and uh, light lines, dark and bright lines, and I'll show you that in a minute. And I've just got a little microphone here to pick up the noise of the sound, of the sand going through. So she's going to move the car directly under it, put some sand in, and watch what we get coming out. Okay, so there's the card going directly underneath it. And I'm going to put some sand in. And it just splits it into two beams. And you'll notice what you get basically is just two big piles. Probably not that clear, but you can see it building up into two piles. Now there's no central maximum like we were getting before. Basically, I, I've gone back to an earlier Im image. You can see the sand falling into two separate piles. Now, you don't get a central max with bright and dark or large and small amounts of sand either side. So <coughs> diffraction really isn't explained well by the particle model. Um, particle model will give you just two big lumps of, or two mounds of sand rather than the distinctive pattern. Okay, I'll move on. Um, okay, this is the diffraction using water waves. So um, just start that. Now that's my voice, you don't need large. that. Turn the sound down. But you can see I've marked the wavelength of the waves like that. Okay, and I'm because I'm going to change the wavelength. Now I'm marking the antinodal lines. That's the maximum displacement. Okay, now <clears throat> you can see it radiates from nothing to maximum, nothing to maximum, and so on. So node, anti-node, node, anti-node. Now I've changed the wavelength. You can see the wavelength is much shorter now. It's from there to there. It's about, uh, and so the antinodal line, the, that's the maximum displacement, has come in now to where I've got the dotted line. Okay, so the shorter the wavelength, the less the amount of diffraction. In other words, the less the bending behind this barrier, if you like. Okay, now. Of course, the syllabus doesn't expect you to relate the wavelength to the slit size or anything like that. You might have in unit two, but certainly for unit um, four, you don't have to. Okay, as long as the students understand diffraction. So let's move on. Now, um, I'm going to. This is where um, a Young first got the idea of doing his experiment. Um, he wrote a paper. Look, um, outlines of experiments inquiries respecting sound and light and what he did was this you can see I've highlighted here he's trying to draw an analogy between light and sound so he knew that sound waves form these loud you know um, loud and soft passages if you had um, two sources of sound that were coherent and you walk past them and the the, goal, the next the next excerpt probably does it better he said um, here, the vibration is alternatively very weak and very strong. So that's um, destructive interference and constructive interference, producing the effect dominated by a beat. Well, the loud, it goes loud and soft, loud and soft, which he's calling beats. Um, now I'll move on. Now what I've done here is um, I've got the two speakers in the background. You can see them. Now they're hooked up to a frequency generator and it's about 1200 hertz or something like that. So they're coherent. They're in phase and coherent, but um, they're just making that sound. Now, what I've got here is just an iPad with an oscilloscope program. Now, one teacher said was impressed with this, and she said, what's the name of the program? And I said, it's Oscilloscope. That's the name of it. And it's by a company called Onyx, O-N-Y-X. I think it was, you know, it's only about four or five dollars. Um, it works really well. You can um, display the, the waveform of the sound. So it's not a proper oscilloscope, it's just 
the microphone's picking up the sound and displaying it as a wave. Now, watch what happens when um, I've got a student walking past. That's the central max, where she is now. Okay. Oh, I've got a yellow tag for this, where the microphone is. Now it goes loud, then it goes soft again. Loud, soft, loud, soft. So she's picking up the maximum minimums. And that's what Thomas Young was referring to as a beat. So you're hearing beats as you went from the central max to a min, max, min, max, and so on. Now, what Young thought was, if that happens in sound, well, if light is a wave, as he was um, proposing, light should undergo this max and minimum sort of idea, um, this interference, diffraction and interference. And so he set up an experiment to test it. Now, let's have a look at the experiment. Um, now, most books don't talk about the actual setup of the experiment. In fact, I've, I haven't found any books. Um, I've tried to talk about it in the Oxford one, but um, I went back to the original papers just to see what he said, and it's not that clear. But basically, he had a, um, a window blind and the sun was shining on it, and there was a little hole. Now, I don't know if he made the hole or it was there. It might have been a little hole for some reason. And the sunlight was streaming through. Now, what he did was um, he wanted to put some slits, so he wanted to divide that up into two. But he had the screen, which was just the opposite wall. So what he did was he used a mirror to deflect the beam to make it go parallel. And he says it was parallel to his bench. So he had basically where I'm, um, I've got the pointer, a bench there, and he had a couple of little stands on it. So he had a stand on the bench with a piece of card, and that cut the beam in two. Now, I suspect he might have had a, a lens or two in here. I don't know. It's it's hard to know. you think the light would spread out, but he doesn't mention it. So he had the card like I did with the sand, and that split the light in two. Now, this is this diagram is really side on. All of this is sort of side on. But um, you can see it's splitting up into two. It's, you're getting the, the waves being produced by each slit, if you like, or each half of the light beam. And it's forming the um, typical diffraction pattern on the screen, starting with central max where it's white, and then it goes dark, white, dark, light, dark, and so on. Okay, so that was his experiment. And in the syllabus, um, they say a student should be familiar with Young's experiment. So basically, he was just taking a beam of light, which he considered coherent because it was so far from the sun. These rays were basically parallel. Wave fronts would have been parallel um, from the sun, um, just selected through a pinhole, and that was radiating out, and then basically split it into two coherent beams with a card, and you got the interference pattern on the screen. Now, often questions, I think in the mock exam, they might have said, What evidence did Young have for um, his model? And the evidence is the light and dark bands. The evidence is not coherent, you know, um, constructive and destructive interference. That's an interpretation. So a lot of books say, you know, the evidence was the constructive and destructive interference. But really the evidence is the light and dark bands. And the interpretation of that in terms of the wave model um, is the um, constructive and destructive interference. Okay, let's move on. Oh, this is just... Um, from Young's paper in 1804 to the Royal Society. Now these come out of the, um, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, 1804. And um, he says, two series of undulations of nearly equal magnitude, cooperating and destroying each other alternatively. alternately. So cooperating means constructive, destroying is destructive interference. So that's pretty neat. Okay. Now, what I thought I'd do is do the same thing. Now, it's so hard to do Young's experiment. I've tried at school many, many times. Been out in the sun with a box with a pinhole. I think there's a um, a good one on YouTube. Um, Veritasium, I think, does one. 
and they use a huge box and they go out into the sun. But he's more looking at um, diffraction. Oh, he's more looking at the um, dispersion of colours through a pinhole. But anyway, uh, what I've done here is I've got a, um, a hair, just a tiny hair, or just a hair from someone's head. Um, and I've just stuck it in this slide. You can see, where's my pointer? Um, it's just an old 35 mil slide um, a slide frame, if you like. And I've got a hair just glued across the front of it. Now that's lit up with a laser. And that screen, that's my blackboard there. It's about well, two metres away. And it's just a nice little dot on the board. It's completely circular. So let's have a look. So I'm going to have a look at the board and what you'll notice, it's a, a spot with all specks around it. Now I go back and look at the, um, the, the slit or the hair again. Now you can see uh, you can see it lighting up in the laser. Now I go back to the screen, have a look. Now all of a sudden we've got a lovely diffraction pattern. Okay, and that's because the hair has split the beam into two, um, two separate beams which interfere. Now that's an easy one to do for the kids. All he needs is a laser and a hair out of someone's head. And basically you've demonstrated well, something equivalent to Young's experiment. So that's pretty neat. Now you can work out, if you wanted to, you can work out the diameter of the hair um, based on the distance to the screen, the um, distance between the max, where is my pointer gone? The distance between the max and mins here. Um, and the wavelength of light and you know what the green is you can just look it up on the side get the wavelength in nanometers and it works out you know whatever it happens to be 0.5 of a millimeter or something like that oh well, no it's less than that 0.05 anyway um, now <clears throat> you can do this again instead of using a hair I've just got one of those commercial diffraction grading so you can see it in the middle of the screen here it's one that has, I think it's um, 100, 300 and 600 lines per millimetre um, on it. And you can choose which one. Now I've got the, I think that might be the 300 lines per millimetre. And the girl is just shining a laser beam through it. And it's going this way onto a screen. So let's have a look. Now this is a great one to do in the class. So she's shining the laser beam. There it is on the board. There's the central max. And there's the first anti-node on the either side. Okay, now she changes from a red laser to a green laser. And you'll notice the central max, she's kept in the same spot. But because of the different wavelength, um, it's a larger wavelength, a uh, smaller wavelength, so you get less diffraction. And here's purple, or a violet colour. Well, it's actually supposed to be a blue. Um, and that's coming even closer. So the higher frequency or the less lower the wavelength the closer they come in and the less the diffraction now you could measure that and in the old days under the old syllabus um, most of us would have measured that and applied the you know n lambda equals d sine theta equals xn d on l uh, and worked out the well confirmed the wavelength if you like um, and you worked out the error in the wavelength um, experimental versus the accepted value. Okay, so let's have a look at the girl measuring stuff. Oh, there's the lasers. Um, now you can see written on them, uh, where's my pointer here, 405 nanometers. So I've got it written up the top as well. 532 for the green and 650 nanometers for the red. Okay, so they're written on it, so it's easy to get. And I've just got her measuring the x value for the first antinodal point. So that's the to the first bright fringe, if you like, we used to call it. Um, where's my pointer here? Let's have a look. And I've asked her just to write the, um, the distances in millimeters. So 430, and you'll notice they're getting smaller. Purple or the blue is even smaller. Okay, now what I've asked, what I did with that is I plotted it so you can plot the wavelength versus the, um, here we go. So blue, green and red lasers, there's the wavelength in nanometers 
and that's my results on the board the fringe spacing and look you plot it and you get a beautiful straight line goes through the origin now i haven't rigged that it actually does that beautifully and you can do calculations on that um i'm not sure if i did them let's have a look oh yeah um that's the old formula n which is the number of the fringe spacing which is one wavelength uh, equals xn which is the fringe spacing here in millimeters you have to convert to meters of course so that'd be 0.34 meters times d that's the spacing of the um, slits which i think it was 600 or might, might have been 300 slits per millimeter so the d is one three hundredth of a millimeter and you'd convert that to meters l is the length of the um the distance between the screen and the slits which is about one and a half or two meters or something you can measure it and you get um you'll notice that the fringe space is proportional to lambda you can actually work it all out um, i'll go back to that but i've worked that out many times in class and it works out really closely within five percent so it's a pretty neat sort of experiment it's a little bit too much for the new syllabus but you've got time um if you want to fiddle around with the numbers it's um, a great little data collecting one look if you haven't got one of those um diffraction gratings you can always just get a dvd and rip the metal layer off now that i've just used a piece of masking tape just stick it on and pull it off hard quickly and it rips them the metal off but you're left with the um, plastic with the the groove you know it's only one groove all the way around but um it's got the grooves and they there's a certain distance apart so they're behaving like a laser so let's have a look just shine the laser on it and you'll notice you're getting the same sort of idea now you can i've got the girl doing the same thing blue red you'll notice the red has a bigger spacing because it's a longer wavelength you can do it with green you know you can if you measure all that you can actually work out the spacing between tracks on a dvd and you can look that up and um, do an error do simple error analysis on that it's quite good um, some other things i do this is just showing in a bit of interference which can't be explained with the wave or the particle model um, it's explaining it beautifully there or it's demonstrating it beautifully uh, with the thin film so the light is slowed down and basically um, inside the film and then it bounces off the rear surface of the film and then is reflected forward where it um, interferes with the incoming reflected light the incoming light that's also reflected off the front surface so the reflection off the back surface and the front surface interfere and depending on the thickness of the film you get different colors um, this is just a neat little one look i got it i bought some of the um the liquid what's happened here oh here we go just gave it gave the kids a um, bubble maker and you can just see the lovely colors the purples and things i follow one down there it is just hold the camera and you can see it showing all its colors now that's always a bit of fun okay now that's newton's rings he just used um a curved piece of glass lying on a flat piece of glass and forms a wedge so there's a sort of a wedge all the way around from the center outwards and uh, where's my cursor there so as you go from the center out um, it's gradually getting a, the spacing between the two surfaces is greater and so you get this pattern of rings and that's called newton's rings that's using well i bought that as newton's rings apparatus it's a few hundred dollars but um, i've had it for a while it's a neat little thing um, but you can do it with two slides and um, two glass slides really if you've got some good microscope slides and put a bit of tissue paper under one end shine some light down on top of it um, preferably laser light or a uv light or something okay move on now this is one that you know works but you can't film it now <clears throat> I just asked a girl i mean i do this little experiment all the time you just hold your fingers your thumb and finger like that up to your eye and look at a bright bulb now i just use a bulb out of the raybox kit at school 
but you can do it at home. You just go out and look at a street light. You really need a, a fairly strong pinpoint source of light um, that you know, it's best at a bit of a distance. So it acts like a pinpoint and you get a diffraction pattern when you hold it up to your eye. Now I tried to photograph it and it's impossible to photograph and you won't see any on the um, internet photograph because I don't know if people can do it, but you can certainly see it with your eye and you can see you get this bright part in the middle and you're getting these little bands like the destructive interference bands either side. Now that's a hopeless photo, but put your eye right up against the, the you know, your fingers and when they're a tiny fraction of a millimetre apart, you get these bright bands, you know, they're coloured bands if you're using a white light out of a ray box kit. That works well. That's um, basically just confirms the wave model. Here's a GIF showing the wave model, waves going through a single slit. There's Huygens principle says each, you know, you know acts as a new source of um, concentric circular waves going out and they're interfering and you get the central max. And then um, basically that's what you'd see with the finger slits bright spot in the middle and then dark and then bright and dark and so on. But that's just a little um, YouTube thing. Now <clears throat> you can also try and show that the particle model doesn't um, model single slit interference very well. And I've just got a funnel full of sand. I'll get the student to take the blue tack off the end and you'll just notice it just forms a big heap in the middle. Um, if that was acting like a wave through a single slit, you'd get peak in the middle, but then you get nothing, and then you get another little mound out the side, and then nothing in another mound. So you'd have that banding of sand in the middle. Now you could argue that you know the sand particles don't match up to the slit size and all this, but really it's just introducing students to the idea of it, and um, it's, it takes a couple of about a minute to do. So here we go, she just removes the, you know, it just forms a big mound in the middle. Okay, that's what 10 seconds for a demo cost you nothing and might make it stick in the kids' heads. Okay, now let's move on. Um, the next, one of the next ones um, is describing light as electromagnetic wave. Now that's what the syllabus said. And so a question on the external exam could be, um, describe light and or describe light in terms of electromagnetic waves. Um, now the thing is they don't really tell you much in the syllabus about what you're supposed to be saying but these are the main points. Now I've listed these in the text. I said you know if you're going to answer this question to cover these five points and the marker will have to mark you right if it's a one mark question or it could be two or three marks who knows or it might be multi-choice okay the first point is that it has to be accelerating electrons or oscillating electrons so we've got here oscillating electric fields that's produced by an accelerating electron so in other words an electron that st speeds up and slows down so it consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields so e and b that are in phase. Now, this is a bit of a nightmare because syllabus says something about them being out of phase. Now, I checked with Ian McCulloch, and I, you know, a UQ um, physicist, and he said, he scratched his head and he said, there's a few things in the syllabus that really need clarifying. If you go back to the original source, which is, I think it was either Gian Coley or um, one of the major texts um, you know, it doesn't really match up with their source um, that they're quoting. Um, but anyway, it's at right angles to each other, yes. And it travels at the speed of light, the speed of C, which is 3 by 10 to the 8. But remember, it's in a vacuum. And we always try and trap students by leaving out the words in a vacuum. And, you know, it doesn't travel always at the speed of 3 by 10 to the 8 um, in you know, in air it basically does, but in water it certainly doesn't. Um, now, another point in this um, 
the content point was the wavelength of peak intensity gets shorter as the filament heats up. Um, so this is the Wien's um, displacement law. And there's a bit of a, there's two terms you've got to be careful. There's the distribution law and the displacement law. So Wien had two laws, um, displacement law, distribution law. Now the syllabus doesn't talk about any, but we have to assume they're talking about the um, displacement law, Wien's displacement law. And you know, we, I'm, in the text I've written it up and I, it's always a possibility in the external exam. So look, anyway, I've just got a close up here of the bulb out of a, um, a Raybox kit. And it's just um, a little filament there. And I'll just increase the voltage. You can see increase the voltage just with a um, just using a rear stat and it goes from you know red to yellow or through to white as you get more and more blue frequencies added in now it's cooling down now it goes from red or yellow to red and back to basically nothing okay now that only takes you know what 30 seconds to do but i think the kids appreciate that it's interesting to see and if you look well, I thought I had another one in here. Um, I thought I had another video. Oh, anyway, it's gone. Okay. Now, the thing I do here is um, we talk about an antenna and how you have oscillating electrons in an antenna. Now, I just bought a one of these quarter wave marine antennas from JCAR. I think it was about eight dollars. Now, four seventy five millimeters, so about half a meter long. It's just a piece of steel, effectively. But, you know, it's, I think it's good for the kids to see what an antenna looks like. Um, just a simple antenna that you can use. And look, I've got a bit of this, some of the stats about it, about the wavelength it um, can pick up and what it can generate and the, the range of wavelengths um, that it can pick up um, or produce if you're going to do it as a... Um, depending on whether you're using it as a receiver or um, giving off a wave, if you like. Anyway, um, look, as the electron moves up and down, let's have a look. So it starts off with the electron is not doing anything. You've got no um, electric field between the ends. So basically it's like having it ready to hook up to a battery, but no battery. So you imagine if you put a battery in there, electric field goes from plus down to minus so it's in the direction down now, if you use your hand rules you can work out the direction of the magnetic field but it'd be at right angles you'll notice it's coming out of the page when the field is going up and down the page or down the page there okay so they're at right angles and then it cuts out and then it goes back and you've got the positive at the bottom so the electric field is up and you're getting the magnetic field in the opposite direction so no field field out of the page no field field into the page no field and so on as the magnetic field the electric component goes from nothing to down nothing to up nothing so on okay that just matches up with this diagram You've got the electric and magnetic fields at right angles as the note said you've got the direction of propagation um, from left to right and um, they're the main things they're at right angles to each other and they're in phase so when the E component reaches a peak the B component reaches a peak and so on now the syllabus the de not the syllabus itself but the um, glossary talks about something about being out of phase so it's worth you know checking out on that um, checking up on that and trying to sort that out but in the review of the syllabus we next year uh, we might try and get something um, cleared up there okay look um i just got a girl to to do this she's going to pretend she's moving a charge up and down this rod so it's going to oscillate up and down and she's got a pen she's just going to draw it on the board and then she's going to walk backwards um, to show the the field os moving out from the antenna Okay, so here she goes up and then down. So that's the oscillating charge up and down the rod. And you get that nice little 
um, curve like that. Now, what I think people forget about is that the oldest part of the wave is the one furthest furthest away, which is over on the right. Come back, um, and um, and the newest part of the wave is the one that was just last created. So, depending on what you're trying to depict with the wave, but basically the old wave is the one furthest away and the newest part is the one closest to the oscillating charge. And I've got the direction of propagation with the red arrow. So I've tried to draw them at right angles. I've got the black is what she drew on the board, uh, which is the electric component. And then I've tried to put in the magnetic field, the magnetic component with it. There's C, that's the direction of, you know, for light anyway, from radio, electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so that's not bad. Um, let's have a look at this one. I've done the same thing, except I just did it on a bit of paper. So she's going to oscillate the charge up and down the rod, but this time we'll move the paper and keep the rod still. Um, see how this works. And you get the same sort of thing. It's a bit hard to do. I only had one go at it. And it's a bit sharp, but you get, you get the idea. So that's a neat little one. And again, I've just shown... Um, just showing the oldest part of the wave and the newest part and so on. Um, just to reinforce the idea of, and what you could do is look at this and you can work out the direction of the magnetic field. But that's a bit tricky because it's not just a simple hand rule. It's, you know, if you look at it, it's, they use a pointing vector, P-O-Y-N-T-I-N-G. It's um, using a right hand rule, but not in the same way as, you know, say Fleming's right hand rule or the slap rule. But, um, you know you could investigate that but it's beyond the syllabus so let's move on now the oscillating electrons in other words electrons that are made to accelerate and then decelerate if you like um, give off electromagnetic radiation so i've got a girl here just with a battery she's going to touch the two ends together and <clears throat> they'll cause electrons to jump which is basically making them accelerate um, as the as they're touched together and a little radio here this is just a um, am radio or am fm radio from j car i think it's about 20 dollars and it's just set between stations so it just picks up static you'll be able to hear it though okay so that's the accelerating electrons traveling through space at the speed of light being picked up by the radio and just um basically turning back into sound neat little thing um, and now let's move on to the next topic which is um, black body radiation now this is um, pretty interesting because I've got a just an image here of a heated horseshoe now in 1880 um, Wilhelm Wien or Willie Wien Willie Wien I suppose you would have called him his, I think his nickname was Willie but um, lived in the um, oh, northern Germany, just on the border, um, um, over the border from Germany. And his parents lived on a farm. His father owned, or the family owned a farm. And the father wasn't um, able to do much work. He, had, he was incapacitated. So Willie did a little bit of work around the farm. But um, he watched the farrier come to shoe the horses and the farrier would just heat up the horseshoes in, he would have probably started with a rod of metal and beaten them into um, horseshoe shape, but heated it up in the, uh, on the coals, and they just pump air into them, get them hot, and would have noticed the colour of the horseshoe going through from no colour, or, you know, just uh, not giving off any colour, to, you know, red to yellow, and then as the more blue end of the spectrum added in, it went through to a white, um, he went to university uh, when he was about 18 or so, and then came back to the farm. But um, he did a lot of work, uh, theoretical work, and he developed his law. Um, I think it was just after he finished, or maybe during his PhD, and um, that's Wien's law. Now, syllabus doesn't mention it, but, you know, there's a question in the mock exam that certainly has it in, so you have to do it. Okay, now... <clears throat> Look, a very simple one. I just got a student to heat up a nail 
in a flame um, just like the bulb before so let's have a look at that now kids like doing this um, doesn't work so well with a pin you need something that will um, not radiate out the heat too much so something with a reasonable volume you can see that it's, it's red with the tip going yellow and it's getting hotter and hotter it's going to a whitish color as the more blue end of the spectrum keeps getting added in and that was it and she liked doing that and move on now I thought well let's do it with a horseshoe like well, Neen did it so I went down to Capalabar in Brisbane and I asked the guy at the dual control shop he, he converts cars into dual controls for riding school um, driving school and um, there's not many people around with oxyacetylene torches these days they're expensive to maintain to hire the equipment to go through all the safety protocols and keep the training going so they outsource a lot of it but some of the mechanics still have it he's got one and he kindly offered to heat up a horseshoe and melt it for me and so i thought oh, i'll do this i filmed it now it took about four minutes but i've cut it right now just for a few seconds um, so he's heating it up i should turn this down a bit he's heating up the horseshoe you can see it going from red to yellow eventually goes to white here it is probably a minute later now that's getting up to about 14 15 maybe 1600 degrees c starts to melt and just watch it all melt i showed this in class the whole four minutes and they just loved it they sort of just sat back and sort of just quite transfixed by the sounds and the sights anyway you get the idea okay now you can do the same thing again except if you want to measure the voltage and current so i've got two meters here a voltmeter set on v which i go up to maybe up to you know 12 volts or something and an ammeter and that's set on the 10 volt setting so basically i just um you can see how the if you did stop that you can see it's a sort of a yellowy red and you could actually work out the power by multiplying v times i now that's two by 0.9 it's about i don't know one watt now you can use um, some of the stefan boltzmann equations to work out that probably the surface temperature of the filament but that's a separate issue so she keeps um, increasing the voltage and it gets whiter and whiter and whiter as the power input goes up um, but that only takes a few minutes to do but um, used to make a great experiment in particularly in for eis back under the old syllabus um, not too bad for um, topic three in the unit one you know which is about uh, electric circuits and so on okay now here's a tricky one <coughs> excuse me this is basically Wien's law but it's got two parts to it it's got the um, distribution law and the displacement law the distribution law is Wien trying to work out the shape of these curves at each temperature now he managed to do that he found a formula that managed to fit those curves to the data but the distribution law is this red line through the middle now it joins up to the peak point at each curve you'll notice the line goes through the peak and so that shape there um, is basically saying that as you increase the temperature you can see you're going through these kelvin temperatures as it goes up to 7000 that line is getting further and further to the left so in other words at lower and lower wavelengths so the, the light being given off is more in the blue region which is high frequency or low wavelengths so Wien's law um, basically just relates the temperature to um, the intensity of light and he's got Wien's constant displacement constant in there now the, the syllabus gives the formula but doesn't mention anything about Wien's law it just talks about well it doesn't really talk about anything so you just have to assume they've put it in for a reason now um, the intensity on this there's no intensity scale now 
if you look on the internet you'll find heaps of these things but they often don't have a scale on the intensity because i don't think anyone knows what to do they just plot they just get an artist to draw a graph that looks much the same and hope for the best but look what i did was and i think some of the kids who are good with maths in your class might have a bit of fun with this i just set up um, an excel spreadsheet um, with three formulas and these are the um, basically the spectral radiance b um, based on the wavelength so b lambda subscript lambda now Rayleigh Jean, Rayleigh and Jeans came up with this law here based on the old classical model of um, electromagnetism, elect about uh, light, I should say, modelling it as vibrating particles. Um, Veen came up with this formula, which he managed to come up with a formula that really just fitted the curve that he knew the experimental results, but you know, wasn't that sure about why he was including certain terms. He just, he knew they would work based on, you know, even on some of the earlier classical models. Now, the third one is Planck's law. Planck wasn't happy with this um, because he knew it didn't make a lot of sense. He came up with this model here. Now, if you plot those three formulas um, in Excel and, and have a look at the shape, You'll see the Rayleigh genes one is this big one here, but the Planck and Veen are very close to each other. So Planck came up with really a theoretical version of Levine's law that had a sort of a theoretical underpinnings that were correct. And of course, we know the underpinnings were to do with light being in chunks that he called quanta. Now he wasn't really talking about photons. He didn't sort of think that far ahead, but Einstein later, um, call them photons and that's about 1904 but the reason I've included this is that it's in the mock exam and you really need to the question said something about um, show how this graph is consistent with um, the modern theory of quanta and why which one represents the classical theory well this big blue one is the classical theory that's the Rayleigh genes law. Now that is called the um, ultraviolet catastrophe because you can see that's heading off, basically just accelerating upwards. And as you get down into the, um, down here into the ultraviolet range, down here between say 200 and 400, that, that line would be way, way up. The amount of light given off at, um, in the ultraviolet should be enormous and it was it would have been impossible um, they called it a catastrophe for the theory whereas Planck and Veen had that tapering off there uh, which is more consistent with the results so kids need to be able to explain what this means when you see that graph I've done it in the text I've tried to explain it well I haven't actually got that graph in the text I've put it in the um, questions um, and I've given the answers, model answers for that, um, because it's not really in the syllabus. It's just in the mock exam. Oh, this is just um, the light given or the radiation given off by objects. Um, if you can measure the uh, wavelength, you can actually measure the um, or predict the temperature based on Wien's law, if nothing else. OK, photoelectric effect. This is the next one to describe. And now, um, basically, the photoelectric effect just talks about the electrons coming out of the valence band and heading off effectively to infinity. They're leaving the surface of the metal. OK, so um, don't think of it in terms of hydrogen, where you have distinct levels. This is just a band of the highest energy level, and it could be a mixture of levels. Now, the work function is a measure of getting the electron out of the metal, now, those electrons are only coming from, you know, maybe the first hundred atoms deep, basically on the surface, and to get them out of the metal onto the surface, that's called the work function. Then any extra energy they've got goes towards accelerating them, and they'll come off with kinetic energy. Um, that's shown by the V. Okay, so in terms of demonstrating that, you can buy a photoelectric effect equipment 
but like I said, it's about $480 and you might want to do it simply. Um, so this is what I do. Look, you just get a um, electroscope and I've just put a piece of zinc on the top and then I'm going to shine a UV light on it, an invisible light. I'll charge it up first. So here we go. Now the noise you can hear at the beginning is just, um, <coughs> excuse me, is just me slapping the um, plastic rod well, it's an ebonite hard plastic rubber a hard rubber rod on a piece of wool um, the faster you can slap it the effectively more charge you transfer and you know gets it more charged so that's the slapping i bring the rod across put it on there transfer the electrons to the electroscope it stays charged bring a white light up to it nothing happens bring a uv light up now that caught the uv causes the electrons to jump out of the conduction band or the valence band and um, off the surface of the metal. So basically the electrons are taken out of the electroscope so it makes it collapse. Okay, so let's try that again. Oh, that's zinc. Now you can see I've written here the, um, the work function is 3.63 electron volts. Okay, now I've just got that there as a number to um, to use in a minute. Let's have a look at aluminium. Now, look, the work function is 4.28. It's bigger. So certainly white light won't do anything to it. So I haven't even bothered. But let's see if ultraviolet light has enough energy, if the photons have enough energy to cause the um, discharge of the electroscope. In other words, giving the electrons in the aluminium on the surface enough energy to make them leave Okay, so charge it up, charge up the rod, put it on the electroscope, remove the rod, it stays charged, bring up a ultraviolet light and nothing happens because the photons don't have sufficient energy to overcome the um, work function of the aluminium. So that's good enough. I mean, that's a neat little experiment. I had a lot of trouble getting it to work, but anyway. Now another one I do is um, I've just got some spectrum spectral tubes hooked up to you know 10,000 volts. I've just got the girl, she's going to get it to discharge like that, and then she's going to turn the voltage down basically so it stops discharging. And I'll bring up some lights. Have a look at this. Here's my arrow. Okay, so it's just she's turned it back enough, just a little bit. Bring up a UV light, and look, it increases the energy of the electrons at the electrodes and it discharges. Now if you do that with white light, nothing happens. Here she is, look, turn it back a bit. Now, there we go, bring up a white light and nothing happens. Okay, so white, even though it's got a bit of UV in it, doesn't have the same um, energy, the photons don't have the same energy as UV light. Um, now as well as um, the external photoelectric effect, which is what you just saw, and the syllabus really only talks about that, or oh, doesn't even say it really, but judging by the um, model exams. But look, you can have what's called the internal photoelectric effect, and in that case, um, you've got the electrons, there's two, two levels in the electrons, there's a valence band, which is the highest occupied level, but there's a conduction band further up where the electrons can move freely um, through the lattice of the metal. Now, um, if, you, if you do this with um, substances that are semiconductors, um, what you can do is this. You bring in the light. The light will cause the electrons to jump up into the conduction band and then they'll fall back down. Now look, here's a picture of a light dependent resistor. These are about a dollar fifty or so from JCAR. And there's a um, just a schematic for it. It's just a little semiconductor, cadmium sulfide probably, um, on the surface there. Okay, just a nice little one to demonstrate. Now you can see there's the little um, photo, the uh, little light dependent resistor. I'm just going to increase the voltage. I oh, know what I'm going to do is um, I've got a girl who's going to um, 
Well, firstly, we're going to measure the resistance, and you can see it there. It's about 5, and the scale there is K ohms, so it's 5K ohms. Now, that's with light shining on it. If you make it go dark, it stops the um, electrons jumping into the conduction band. So it stops it from being such a good conductor. In other words, increases its, its resistance. So watch this. So here we go. Now she puts a hand across it, put a finger on it. So it's 6K ohms at the moment. And righto, make it go dark. And look, it's up to 66K ohms now. So it's 10 times the resistance. That's because she's stopping the electrons jumping by cutting out the light. Okay, so that's a nice little one to show. And look, you can use that if you've got time you want to make up a circuit. I've just made up, here's that thing there is the light dependent resistor. I've got a um, NPN transistor there. And a light, in, um, a light emitting diode here and a protection resistor, another resistor here. So what happens is I've got this is the zero terminal from a power supply. That's nine volts. Now, the, elect the zero is all the way across here. Now, if that's acting in bright light, that's acting a very high resistance. And, um, sorry, a very low resistance. So effectively, that zero voltage, where's my pointer? That zero voltage extends all the way across to here because that's acting like just a piece of wire, really, in bright light. So the base is held at zero volts, so that transistor doesn't conduct, so this thing doesn't light up. But watch what happens when she make, we make it go dark. So you make it go dark, and it, the light comes on. Look, I'll just stop that for a second. Oh, can I stop it? Hang on, where's my pointer? I'll just stop it here somewhere. Uh, anyway, you get the idea. Um, what what's happening is there we are. Um, in when it goes dark, that effectively is um, making this a very high resistance. So it's like taking that whole thing away. So the base of the transistor goes high. You say it goes high. So there's the nine volts coming in. If it loses a few volts across here, say eight volts or eight and a half volts. So you get about 0 0.6 volts at the base, which turns the transistor on. So the current, the electrons go up there through the transistor, out through the diode and light it up, then through the resistor and out to the nine volts. Um, so it's acting like a light, a light switch. And that's the thing used on the... Um, and the power poles for your street lights. So when it goes dark in the evening, street lights come on. Okay, now let's move on. Oh, that's the circuit for it. If you ever want to make it up, um, I've just given you the values of the uh, resistors and the type of um, transistor it is and so on. Um, it's a nice little demo you can make up just with a breadboard. All the bits and pieces you can get from JCAR. It probably cost you well, maybe five dollars or so to make. Oh, look, this is just shining some UV light onto some um, tonic water. Now, the quinine in the tonic water absorbs the UV, absorbs in the UV, but then there's a transition inside the quinine where the electrons jump a little bit. Well, not don't they actually jump. They they tran undergo a transition to a lower level by a non-radiative transition. So they don't give off light. They just basically lose it as heat um, or in oscillations of the electrons. And then then they jump. The electron jumps to the bottom level. But it's giving off light and goes in in the UV. So it's absorbed in the UV. But fluoresces in the, um, in this case, in a yellowy sort of color. You'll see it. So she shines it on. That's white light. So nothing much is happening. But look at um, UV light. So it absorbs the UV light, but emits in the yellowy green part of the spectrum. And, oh, look, I've just done it with some fishing lures, just some stuff from BCF. Um, sorry, um, yeah, boating, yeah, yeah BCF. Um, and basically it's just um, 
the light is absorbed in the UV and it's given out in a, um, a different frequency, so an invisible frequency. Okay, but it brights, lights up really well. Look, um, oh, that's, I think I had a, where did we go? Um, no, I was just going to show you that here, where's my pointer? If you, I just had a piece of, um, go, a piece of um, nylon lure, you know, that's kind of coated with a fluorescent substance as well. Anyway, but you can see here, it absorbs in the, well, it's not so much in the UV, but it absorbs in um, this bluey region and then emits. So it's excited in the blue blue region and then emits in the green region but you'll get other things like oh, this girl's here uh, she's her teeth you know because they're made from dentine which is basically um, a hydroxyapatite um, so it absorbs it's excited in um, the blue violet end of the spectrum but then um, is fluoresces basically in the um, more in the uh, further up in the visible and she's just chewing on some vitamin b tablet so vitamin b similarly absorbs at a lower wavelength and gives it off at a higher wavelength um, i was trying to get her to drink um drink some but you can see the colors it's a bright bluey sort of yellow it's horrible color but if, if you make it up in a solution and drink it you can have a mouthful of this glowing liquid under uv okay well, here's the UV tablet. Look, they absorb. Where's my pointer? They absorb down here in the UV. So it absorbs the UV light and then emits or fluoresces up in the yellowy green um, wavelengths. Okay, so it's still absorbing um, and then transmitting. So basically, you've got the energy levels, which is a part of the um, quantum theory, um, looking at the different uh, light in, given off by. Uh, electrons in the different levels. Now, I put this in just to start a bit of a discussion with the kids. It's a Crookes radiometer, and you'll notice if I nothing much is happening, but I allow some light to fall on the paddles, they turn. But you'll notice they turn away from the black. Okay. Now, and if I put the the um, piece of card back in, it stops them turning and they just slow down and so on. Now, you can ask students whether that supports the wave model or the particle model. Um, the answer, really, is it doesn't, or you can explain it by either model. Some people try and tell you it's the, the momentum of the photons that's causing it to happen, but it turns out, really, what it is, is the, the black side of the um, paddle is heating up more so than the white white sides so the gas expands on the back and the gas tries to get across to fill up the because you get a higher pressure the gas then goes across the edge of the paddle to form a to go to the white where it was lower pressure and so the movement of the gas particles from the black to the white um, has to be counted by you know conservation of momentum and you can work out the direction it must move so it doesn't really support either model it supports both or if you like um, now a nice little experiment you can do is measuring Planck's constant using some LEDs look I've just photographed I bought five LEDs from JCAR they're about a dollar oh, I think I don't know if they're a dollar each oh here we are a dollar ten each but you've got to get the clear ones now they're all clear except I put a voltage across each one and photographed it when it lit up. Um, here's the red ones with the coloured glass. Now you don't use those because um, the colour is not... You want the colour of the actual light in the semiconductor part, not just in the plastic itself. Now this is what the syllabus says. Describe the concept of a photon, solve problems, describe the photoelectric effect define the term Planck's constant. Well, we can actually measure Planck's constant using this. Look, um, this is all I did. Um, if you think of, um, I was talking about the internal um, photoelectric effect. Basically, 
An electron in the valence band can be raised into the conduction band by putting in some energy, so electrical energy from the power supply. Now that supplies FV, which is the forward voltage that it, those um, diodes turn on at, times the charge on the electron, or the elementary charge. So that's the energy that each electron gets from the power supply. Now that electric, that electron then falls back to um, its original level and gives off a photon. Now you do get a little bit of energy losses inside the junction, the, the PN junction, um, which is in the, the diode part of it. Um, but basically the energy going in equals the energy coming out. And so V times Q going in equals HF. So what you can do is this, set up a little circuit. Um, I did a simpler circuit than this I, because I had a variable power supply um, rather than the, the ordinary la uh, laboratory power supplies just go up in steps of two volts. If you can get one that goes up continuously, you can eliminate all of this and just have just gradually turn up the voltage and measure when the lead turns on and measure the current at the same time. But um, oh, here's the original circuit I did. You can see the lead down in there, voltmeter, ammeter, switch, rheostat just to adjust the voltage because this is the voltage in two volt steps which is not accurate enough. You need to get up to up to two volts in small steps. Um, here's the one I did. Look, um, I just have the, there's a resistor there to protect the lead so it doesn't burn out. Um, and basically just the voltmeter and the ammeter. I've got that reading in, M, in milliamps. Um, look, here's a picture of, I just turned up the voltage and I just filmed it as it was going. And when it gets to 2.3 volts, it actually lights up. Okay, and then it stays lit up. So what you're after is that point somewhere in here, look just about there, you can see the light is just coming off through. You can see at the top of the lens and then it just gets, a, or maybe there somewhere. Now, to get the exact value, what you can do, um, is this just watch what happens now I gradually turn up the voltage you can see here it's going up the current is zero and then all of a sudden you'll notice the light comes on there it is there 2.17 volts there's no current yet but I'll just keep going a little bit more right 2.3 2. a little bit more a little bit more it's getting brighter and brighter, and then all of a sudden you're getting some current. Now, if you had this reading in microamps, you'd see it, but I just did in milliamps. Okay, so really you're getting pair of, pairs of data. And if you plot that, um, you get something really interesting. Right, I'll let that go right through. You Best to stop at about no more than 50 milliamps because you tend to burn them out. Um, now, look, I plotted that, and you get this lovely looking graph, and you'll notice... It's got a, a bend um, down here, about 1.67 volts, like I said, and then it shoots up. It's fairly linear. Now, the question is, what's the turn on voltage or the forward voltage that it turns on? You can just put a ruler and line, draw that through there and see where it cuts the voltage axis. Look, I've done it. There it is there. So we consider this to be the forward voltage. What's that, about 1.5, 1.8? about 1.86 or something like that okay and then I did it for the other the four colors um, that I got from JCAR and just did the same thing just plot them and draw a straight line to get the forward voltage or the cutoff or, or the starting voltage if you like and look I plotted this now here's the wavelength for each color now that's in the catalog or you can look it up from the Jacob JCAR website, convert that to a frequency, and there's your voltage. So you plot frequency versus voltage, you get a pretty straight line, almost goes through zero. There's a bit of a energy losses, um, but basically um, you're 
you know, you do get some of the energy losses in the PN junction. So that's a little bit of systematic error there. But it's pretty straight. If you can get a couple more, you could get that straighter. Um, you got to be careful about, I think, the aqua. I've said here, look, aqua, avoid. I think it's a mixture of two different um, types of semiconductor. To get the aqua color, they mix a couple together. So it's not a single voltage um, or single compound with a single frequency. Okay. Look, the simple equation is E equals HF. Now, that's in the syllabus. So I'm letting E equal VQ, which is in the syllabus for unit. I think that's probably unit two, but our uh, unit one might be also in unit three. Um, so I'm letting the energy, the voltage, time, the V times the electric charge on the electron um, equal the HF. So rearrange that. And now V on F is the gradient. So Planck's constant H is the gradient time the, times the charge on the electron. So if you look back here, the gradient was 0.4203. So there is there, but the bottom, whoops, the bottom scale was by 10 to the 14. Okay, so um, why have I got minus? That's, something's gone wrong here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's V divided by F, yeah. So um, that's by 10 to the negative 14, of course, um, times the charge on the electron, and you get that value there. Now, that looks like Planck's constant to me, but I just did the you know, absolute error. It's Planck's constant minus, sorry, the ex observed value here minus the accepted value. That's the error, absolute error. Just work it out as a percentage error we get about two percent so that's a pretty neat little experiment if you want to measure Planck's constant now look we're nearly finished um the second part really there's not a lot going on here that I can do in the classroom Rutherford's model is probably the only bit and the line spectra of um of hydrogen really so look all I've got here is a wine glass with a raised base so that's acting as a potential hill so think of the base as being the positive charge in the nucleus. And I'm going to roll in alpha particles, which are just marbles or steel balls. And they're going to be repelled by the um, positive nucleus. But it's like a potential hill. They've got to rise up. So they deflect off. So now if you remember, Rutherford said it was like firing bombs at a piece of tissue paper and them coming right back at you. So... You can see that one. Watch this next one. Oh, it's coming straight back, as Rutherford said. So just a little, simple little demo to show um, the scattering of alpha particles off the nucleus of a gold, gold foil, gold atoms, really. So that's pretty neat. Now, look, um, I've never had much luck with this. I've got a hydrogen spectrum tube here. I've got a um, spectrum analyzer hooked up to it with a little um, piece of cable with a um, a little optic fiber in it so it's measuring it's taking the light from the hydrogen discharge tube and analyzing it now i've seen some really clear ones done by teachers but i'm just something's gone wrong with mine i just couldn't get it to work very well but i'll give you the idea of what you get so there's the hydrogen discharge and it should have four lines in the visible it's taken down to just a spectrophotometer and this is building up a picture and you can see a few peaks in there now if you leave it long enough it'll build up a picture with four major peaks um, mine didn't didn't do that but you can see a couple of peaks are starting to build up but it keeps sampling but I think I was getting a lot of white light coming in and it wasn't working too well. Now, I've seen that done really well. So um, I you know, urge you to have a look at that if you've got that equipment. And now this is just a simpler one. All I'm doing is looking at a spectrum of hydrogen. I just bring over a diffraction grating and bring that up close to the camera lens. I'm just using a phone. And now if you look to the side, you can see the lines. There they are there. There's the 
red and aqua lines. There's a couple of purple ones that don't show up well. But that's how many centimetres they are from the central max, if you like. And based on that distance and based on the distance you are away from the, um, the light, the, the way the, um, the distance between the slits and the light, and um, you can actually work out the wavelength of each of those four lines and oh, I actually did it for two lines, the major line. Look, I got 666 nanometers, the accepted value is 656, 491 the accepted is 4, 487 and that's about it. So um, I'll just finish there. So I had both sessions, the UQ and this session. Um, so both basically the same. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for that. And that's about it. Bye.